Chapter Nine of *The Ghost: A Modern Fantasy* by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Nine: The Train. The boat train was due to leave in ten minutes, and the platform at Victoria Station, how changed since then, showed that scene of discreet and haughty excitement which it was wont to exhibit about nine o'clock every evening in those days. The weather was wild. It had been wet all day, and the rain came smashing down, driven by the great gusts of a genuine westerly gale. Consequently, there were fewer passengers than usual, and those people who by choice or compulsion had resolved to front the terrors of the Channel Passage had a preoccupied look as they hurried importantly to and fro amid piles of luggage and groups of loungers on the wind-swept platform beneath the flickering gas lamps. But the porters and the friends engaged in the ceremony of seeing off, and the loungers and the bookstall clerks, these individuals were not preoccupied by thoughts of intimate inconveniences before midnight. As for me, I was quite alone with my thoughts. At least, I began by being alone. As I was registering a particularly heavy and overfed portmanteau to Paris, a young woman put her head close to mine at the window of the baggage office. Miss Foster, I thought it was. My cab set down immediately after yours, and I've been trying to catch your eye on the platform. Of course it was no go. The speech was thrown at me in a light, airy tone from a tiny, pert mouth which glistened red behind a muslin veil. Miss Deschamps, I exclaimed. Glad you remember my name. As handsome and supercilious as ever, I observe. I haven't seen you since that night at Sullivan's reception. Why didn't you call on me one Sunday? You know I asked you to. Did you ask me? I demanded, secretly flattered in the extremity of my youthfulness because she had called me supercilious. Well, rather, I'm going to Paris and in this weather. I am too. Then let's go together, eh? Delighted. What by have you chosen such a night? I haven't chosen it. You see, I am tomorrow at the Casino de Paris for fourteen nights, and I suppose I've got to be there. You wouldn't believe what they're paying me. The Diana Company is touring in the provinces while the theatre is getting itself decorated. I hate the provinces. Leeds and Liverpool and Glasgow. Fancy dancing there. And so my half-sister, Carlotta, you know, got me this engagement, and I'm going to stay with her. Have you met Carlotta? No, not yet. I did not add that I had reason to think a good deal about her. Well, Carlotta is Carlotta. A terrific swell and a bit of a tartar. We quarrel every time we meet, which isn't often. She tries to play the elder sister game on me, and I won't have it. Though she is elder, very much elder, you know. But I think her worst point is that she's so frightfully mysterious. You could never tell what she's up to. Now, a man I met at supper last night told me he thought he'd seen Carlotta in Bloomsbury yesterday. However, I didn't believe that, because she's expecting me in Paris. We happen to be as thick as thieves just now, and if she'd been in London, she would have looked me up. Just so, I replied, wondering whether I should endeavour to obtain from Marie de Chon information which would be useful to Rosa. By the time that the star of the Diana had said good-bye to certain male acquaintances, and had gone through a complicated dialogue with her maid on the subject of dress trunks, the clock pointed almost to nine, and a porter rushed us, Marie and myself, into an empty compartment of a composite coach near to the engine. The compartment was first class, but it evidently belonged to an ancient order of rolling stock, and the vivacious Marie criticised it with considerable freedom. The wind howled, positively howled, in the station. I wish I wasn't going, said the lady. I shall be horribly ill. You probably will, I said to tease her, idly opening the globe. It seems that the morning steamer from Calais wasn't able to make either Dover or Folkestone, and has returned to Calais. Imagine the state of mind of the passengers. Ugh! Oh, Mr. Foster, what is that case by your side? It is a jewel case. What a big one! She did not conceal her desire to see the inside of it, but I felt that I could not, even to satisfy her charming curiosity, expose the interior of Rosa's jewel case in a railway carriage and so I edged away from the topic with as much adroitness as I was capable of. The pretty girl pouted, and asked me for the globe behind which she buried herself. 
She kept murmuring aloud extracts from the Globe's realistic description of the weather, and then she jumped up. I'm not going. Not going? No, the weather's too awful. These newspaper accounts frighten me. But the Casino de Paris? A fig for it. They must wait for me, that's all. I'll try again tomorrow. Would you mind telling the guard to get my boxes out? There's a dear, Mr. Foster, and I'll endeavour to find that maid of mine. The train was already five minutes late in starting. She delayed it quite another five minutes and enjoyed the process. And it was I who meekly received the obligations of porters and guard. My reward was a smile, given with a full sense of its immense value. Goodbye, Mr. Foster. Take care of your precious jewel case. I carried the thing in my hand up and down the platform. I ran to my carriage and jumped in breathless as the train whistled. Pleasant journey, the witch called out, waving her small hands to me. I bowed to her from the window, laughing. She was a genial soul, and the incident had not been without amusement. After I had shut the carriage door and glanced out of the window for a moment in the approved way, I sank, faintly smiling at the episode, into my corner, and then I observed with a start that the opposite corner was occupied. Another traveller had got into the car apartment while I had been coursing about the platform on behalf of Marie, and that traveller was the mysterious and sinister creature whom I had met twice before, once in Oxford Street, and once again during the night watch in the Cathedral at Bruges. He must have made up his mind to travel rather suddenly, for in spite of the weather he had neither overcoat nor umbrella, merely the frock coat and silk hat of Piccadilly. But there was no sign of rain on him, and no sign of disarray. As I gazed with alarmed eyes into the face of that strange, forbidding personality, the gaiety of my mood went out like a match in a breeze. The uncomfortable idea oppressed me that I was being surely caught and enveloped in a net of adverse circumstances, that I was the unconscious victim of a deep and terrible conspiracy which proceeded slowly forward to an inevitable catastrophe. On each of the previous occasions when this silent and malicious man had crossed my path, I had had the same feeling, but in a less degree, and I had been able to shake it off almost at once. But now it overcame and conquered me. The train thundered across Grosvenor Bridge through the murky weather on its way to the coast, and a hundred times I cursed it for its lack of speed. I would have given much to be at the journey's end and away from this motionless and inscrutable companion. His eyes were constantly on my face, and do what I could, I could not appear at ease. I tried to read the paper. I pretended to sleep. I hummed a tune. I even went so far as to whistle but my efforts at saint froid were ridiculous. The worst of it was that he was aware of my despicable condition. His changeless, cynical smile made that fact obvious to me. At last I felt that something must happen. At any rate, the silence of the man must be broken, and so I gathered together my courage, and with a preposterous attempt at a friendly smile remarked, "'Beastly weather we're having. One would scarcely expect it so early in September.' It was an inane speech, so commonplace, so entirely foolish. And the man ignored it, absolutely. Only the corners of his lips drooped a little to express perhaps a profounder degree of hate and scorn. This made me a little angry. Didn't I see you last in the Cathedral of Bruges? I demanded curtly, even rudely. He laughed, and his laugh really alarmed me. The train stopped at that moment at a dark and deserted spot, which proved to be sitting ball. I hesitated, and then, giving up the struggle, sped out of the compartment and entered another one lower down. My new compartment was empty. The sensation of relief was infinitely soothing. Placing the jewel case carefully on my knees, I breathed freely once more, and said to myself that another quarter of an hour of that detestable presence would have driven me mad. I began to think about Rosetta Rosa. As a solace after the exasperating companionship of that silent person in the other compartment, I invited from the back of my mind certain thoughts about Rosetta Rosa, which had been modestly waiting for me there for some little time. And I looked at them fairly, and turned them over, and viewed them from every side, and derived from them a rather thrilling joy. The fact is, 
I was beginning to be in love with Rosa. Nay, I was actually in love with her. Ever since our first meeting, my meditations had been more or less busy with her image. For a long period, largely owing to my preoccupation with Areska, I had dreamed of her but vaguely. And now, during our interviews at her hotel and in the church of St. Giles, she had in the most innocent way in the world forged fetters on me, which I had no desire to shake off. It was a presumption on my part. I acknowledged frankly that it was a presumption. I was a young doctor with nothing to distinguish me from the ruck of young doctors, and she was, well, she was one of those rare and radiant beings to whom even monarchs bow, and the whole earth offers the incense of its homage. Which did not in the least alter the fact that I was in love with her. And after all, she was just a woman. More, she was a young woman. And she had consulted me. She had allowed me to be of use to her. And months ago in London had she not permitted me to talk to her with an extraordinary freedom. Lovely, incomparable, exquisite as she was, she was nevertheless a girl, and I was sure that she had a girl's heart. However, it was a presumption. I remembered her legendary engagement to Lord Clanonceau, an engagement which had interested all Europe. I often thought of that matter. Had she loved him, really loved him? Or had his love for her merely flattered her into thinking that she loved him? Would she not be liable to institute comparisons between myself and that renowned, wealthy and gifted nobleman? Well, I did not care if she did. Such is the egoism of untried love that I did not care if she did. And I lapsed into a reverie, a reverie in which everything went smoothly, Everything was for the best in the best of all possible worlds, and only love and love's requital existed. Then, in the fraction of a second, as it seemed, there was a grating, a horrible grind of iron, a bump, a check, and my head was buried in the cushions of the opposite side of the carriage, and I felt stunned. Not much, but a little. What? What? I heard myself exclaim. They must have plumped the brakes on pretty sudden. Then, quite after an interval, it occurred to me that this was a railway accident, one of those things that one reads of in the papers with so much calmness. I wondered if I was hurt, and why I could hear no sound. The silence was absolute, terrifying. In a vague, aimless way, I sought for my matchbox and struck a light. I had just time to observe that both windows were smashed and the floor of the compartment tilted, and the match went out in the wind. I had heard no noise of breaking glass. I stumbled slowly to the door and tried to open it, but the thing would not budge. Whereupon I lost my temper. Open, you beast, you beast, you beast! I cried to the door, kicking it hard and yet not feeling the impact. Then another thought, a proud one, which served to tranquilise me. I am a doctor and they will want me to attend to the wounded. I remembered my flask, and, unscrewing the stopper with difficulty, clutched the mouth with my teeth and drank. After that I was sane and collected. Now I could hear people tramping on the ground outside and see the flash of lanterns. In another moment a porter, whose silver buttons gleamed the darkness, was pulling me through the window. Hurt? No, not I, but if anyone else is, I'm a doctor. Here's a doctor, sir, he yelled to a grey-headed man nearby. Then he stood still, wondering what he should do next. I perceived in the near distance the lights of a station. Is that Dover? Oh, no, sir, Dover Priory. Dover's a mile further on. There was a goods wagon got derailed on the siding just beyond the home signal, and it blocked the down line, and the driver of the express ran right into it. Although well, the signal was against him, ran right into it, he did. Other people were crawling out of the carriages now, and suddenly there seemed to be scores of spectators, and much shouting and running about. The engine lay on its side, partly overhanging a wrecked wagon. Immense clouds of steam issued from it, hissing above the roar of the wind. The tender was twisted like a patent hairpin in the middle. The first coach, a luggage van, stood upright and seemed scarcely damaged. The second coach, the small old-fashioned vehicle which happily I had abandoned at Sittingbourne, was smashed out of resemblance to a coach. The third one, from which I had just emerged, looked fairly healthy and the remaining three had not even left the rails. All ran to the smashed coach. 
There were two passengers in that coach, said the guard, who, having been at the rear of the train, was unharmed. Are you counting me, I asked, because I changed carriages at Sittingbourne. Praise God for that, sir, he answered. There's only one, then, a tall, severe-looking gent in the first-class compartment. Was it joy or sorrow that I felt at the fault of that man buried somewhere in the shapeless mass of wood and iron? It certainly was not unmixed sorrow. On the contrary, I had a distinct feeling of elation at the thought that I was probably rid forever of this haunter of my peace, this menacing and mysterious existence which, if instinctive foreboding was to be trusted, had been about to cross and thwart and blast my own. The men hammered and heaved and chopped and sawed, and while they were in the midst of the work, someone took me by the sleeve and asked me to go and attend to the engine driver and stoker, who were being carried into a waiting room at the station. It is symptomatic of the extraordinary confusion which reigns in these affairs that till that moment the question of the fate of the men in charge of the train had not even entered my mind, though I had of course noticed that the engine was overturned. In the waiting room it was discovered that two local doctors had already arrived. I preferred to leave the engine driver to them. He was unconscious as he lay on a table. The stoker, by his side, kept murmuring in a sort of delirium, Bill, he was dazed like oh, he was all dazed like I told him the singer wasn't off. I judged him, but he was all dazed like I returned to the train, full of a horrible desire to see with my own eyes a certain corpse. Bit by bit, the breakdown gang had removed the whole of the centre part of the shattered carriage. I thrust myself into the group, and we all looked at each other. Nobody alive or dead was to be found. He too must have got out at Sittingbourne. I said at length. Aye, said the guard. My head swam, dizzy with dark imaginings and unspeakable suspicions. He has escaped. He is alive, I muttered savagely, hopelessly. It was as if a doom had closed inevitably over me. But if my thoughts had been legible, and I had been asked to explain this attitude of mine towards a person who had never spoken to me, whom I had seen but thrice, and whose identity was utterly unknown, I could not have done so. I had no reasons. It was intuition. Abruptly I straightened myself, and, surveying the men and the background of ruin lighted by the fitful gleams of lanterns and the pale glitter of a moon half hidden by flying clouds, I shouted out, I want a cab. I have to catch the Calais boat. Will somebody please direct me? No one appeared even to hear me. The mental phenomena which accompany a railway accident even a minor one such as this, are of the most singular description. I felt that I was growing angry again. I had a grievance because not a soul there seemed to care whether I caught the Calais boat or not. That, under the unusual circumstances, the steamer would probably wait, did not occur to me. Nor did I perceive that there was no real necessity for me to catch the steamer. I might just as well have spent the night at the Lord Warden and proceeded on my journey in the morning. But no, I must hurry away instantly. Then I thought of the jewel-box. "'Where's my jewel-box?' I demanded vehemently from the guard, as though he had stolen it. He turned to me. "'What's that you're carrying?' he replied. All the time I had been carrying the jewel-box. At the moment of the collision I must have instinctively clutched it, and my grasp had not slackened. I had carried it to the waiting-room and back without knowing that I was doing so. This sobered me once more, but I would not stay on the scene. I was still obsessed by the desire to catch the steamer, and abruptly I set off walking down the line. I left the crowd and the confusion and the ruin, and hastened away, bearing the box. I think that I must have had no notion of time and very little notion of space, for I arrived at the harbour without the least recollection of the details of my journey thither. I had no memory of having been accosted by any official of the railway, or even of having encountered any person at all. Fortunately, it had ceased to rain, and the wind, though still strong, was falling rapidly. Except for a gatekeeper, the bleak, exposed pier had the air of being deserted. The lights of the town flickered in the distance, and above them rose dimly the gaunt outlines of the fortified hills. In front was the intemperate and restless sea. I felt that I was at the extremity of England, and on the verge of unguessed things. Now I had traversed about half the length of the lonely pier, which seemed to curve right out into the unknown. 
when I saw a woman approaching me in the opposite direction. My faculties were fatigued with the crowded sensations of that evening, and I took no notice of her. Even when she stopped to peer into my face, I thought nothing of it, and put her gently aside, supposing her to be some dubious character of the night hours. But she insisted on speaking to me. You are Carl Foster, she said abruptly. The voice was harsh, trembling, excited, yet distinguished. Suppose I am, I answered wearily. How tired I was. I advise you not to go to Paris. I began to arouse my wits, and I became aware that the woman was speaking with a strong French accent. I searched her face, but she wore a thick veil, and in the gloom of the pier I could only make out that she had striking features and was probably some forty years of age. I stared at her in silence. I advise you not to go to Paris, she repeated. Who are you? Never mind, take my advice. Why, shall I be robbed? Robbed, she exclaimed, as if that was a new idea to her. Yes, she said hurriedly, those jewels might be stolen. How do you know that I have jewels? I, I saw the case. Don't trouble yourself, madam, I shall take particular care not to be robbed. But may I ask how you have got hold of my name? I had vague ideas of an ingenious plan for robbing me, the particulars of which this woman was ready to reveal for her consideration. She ignored my question. Listen, she said quickly, you are going to meet a lady in Paris, is it not so? I must really. Take advice, move no further in that affair. I attempted to pass her, but she held me by the sleeve. She went on with emphasis. Rosetta Rosa will never be allowed to sing in Carmen at the Opera Comique. Do you understand? Great Scott, I said, I believe you must be Carlotta Deschamps. It was a half-humorous inspiration on my part, but the remark produced an immediate effect on the woman, for she walked away with a highly theatrical scowl and toss of the head. I recalled what Marie Deschamps had said in the train about her stepsister, and also my suspicion that Rosa's maid was not entirely faithful to her mistress, spied on her, in fact, and, putting the two things together, it occurred to me that this strange lady might actually be Carlotta. Many women of the stage acquire a habitual staginess and theatricality, and it was quite conceivable that Carlotta had relations with Yvette, and that, ridden by the old jealousy which had been aroused through the announcement of Rosa's return to the Opera Comique, she was setting herself, in an indefinite, clumsy, stealthy and melodramatic manner, to prevent Rosa's appearance in Carmen. No doubt she had been informed of Rosa's conference with me in the Church of St. Giles, and impelled by some vague, obscure motive, had travelled to London to discover me, and having succeeded, was determined by some means to prevent me from getting into touch with Rosa in Paris. So I conjectured roughly, and subsequent events indicated that I was not too far wrong. I laughed. The notion of the middle-aged prima donna going about in waste places at dead of night to work mischief against a rival was indubitably comic. I would make a facetious narrative of the meeting for the amusement of Rosa at a breakfast tomorrow in Paris. Then, feeling all at once at the end of my physical powers, I continued my way and descended the steps to the Calais boat. All was excitement there. Had I heard of the railway accident? Yes, I had. I had been in it. Instantly, I was surrounded by individuals who raked me fore and aft with questions. I could not endure it. My nervous energy, I realised, was exhausted, and, having given a brief outline of the disaster, I fled down the saloon stairs. My sole desire was to rest. The need of unconsciousness, of forgetfulness, was imperious upon me. I had had too many experiences during the last few hours. I stretched myself on the saloon cushions, making a pillar of the jewel box. Shall we start soon? I murmured to a steward. Oh, yes, sir, in another five minutes. Weather's moderating, sir. Other passengers were in the saloon, and more followed. As this would be the first steamer to leave Dover that day, there was a good number of voyagers on board, in spite of adverse conditions. I heard people talking, and the splash of waves against the vessel's sides, and then I went to sleep. Nothing could have kept me awake. End of chapter 9